webinar. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on human trafficking and the role of faith-based organizations. My name is Jenna Novak, and I'm the Deputy Director of the National Human Trafficking Training and Technical Assistance Center, or NITAC. NITAC is funded by the Office of Trafficking in Persons in the Department of Health and Human Services. We deliver training and technical assistance to inform and enhance a public health response to human trafficking. By applying a public health approach, NITAC holistically builds the capacity of communities to identify and respond to the complex needs of all survivors of human trafficking and address the root causes that make individuals, families, and communities vulnerable to trafficking. NITAC is committed to building the health and human services capacity of professionals to reduce the vulnerabilities of those most at risk of human trafficking, increase victim identification and access to trauma-informed services for all survivors, and to strengthen short, medium, and long-term health and well-being of survivors and human trafficking. So just a quick, a few quick housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, if there are any technical difficulties, please be patient. We have two people who are currently managing the technology for this webinar, and they're working as quickly and efficiently as possible. Um, just a reminder that there is a chat box. Please do use the chat box to ask questions and engage, and we will have time at the end to answer questions. But throughout the webinar, we will be asking several different poll questions um, that are addressed to you all as the audience. And please do engage. It will make this whole experience much more fruitful. The webinar is being recorded and will be available online in the next couple of weeks. So be on the lookout from an email from NITAC um, for, with the recording. So without further ado, let's get started. I am thrilled to have our incredibly talented and knowledgeable speakers with us today. Um, unfortunately, one of our speakers had an emergency that he had to attend to, so he isn't able to make it. And we, of course, wish him all the best. Um, but we still do have two fabulous um, presenters, and I will um, allow each of them to uh, give to give their own introduction and to identify the perspective that they are representing in today's webinar in just a few sentences. So, Marissa, do you want to go ahead and get started? Sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Marissa Castellanos, and I'm the program director at the Bikita Empowerment Initiative at Catholic Charities of Louisville. The Bikita Empowerment Initiative is a program within Catholic Charities uh, of Louisville that addresses human trafficking and provides direct services. Uh, our program has existed for about 10 years now, and um, so I've worked within a faith-based organization while also interacting with other faith-based organizations and certainly many organizations that are not faith-based. And so that's the perspective I'll bring today is as a direct service provider at a faith-based, community-based service provider agency. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. This is Dr. Karen Countryman Roseworm, and I am the founder and executive director of the Center for Combating Human Trafficking at Wichita State University. Um, and I bring some interesting perspectives. First of all, as a person who has experienced life on the streets and within systems um, of care, social service systems, as well as criminal legal systems, and that has shaped absolutely much of my perspective. Um, and then now, after 22 years working in direct service, I am really, um, my, my perspective that I'll be sharing today is very much informed by a belief that we absolutely need um, survivor-centered, uh, survivor-informed, and overcome-led, overcomer-led services in this field within this anti-trafficking movement. And I absolutely believe that working with faith-based organizations is critical specifically because they offer accessibility to long-term relationships and community that can be transformational in the lives of anyone who has experienced various forms of trauma. Great. Thank you both very much. So what we are going to learn together today, we have um, three different uh, learning objectives. So first is 
we will be able to identify multidisciplinary intersections specific to faith-based partnerships and outreach, and how these intersections shape our response to human trafficking, how faith-based entities can mobilize and partner with community-based organizations to proactively identify and provide outreach to populations at risk of trafficking, and successful models that have been used to coordinate and establish a continuum of care for individuals who have been trafficked. So to start, we're going to do a, a quick overview of human trafficking. Human trafficking occurs when a trafficker exploits a vulnerable victim by using force, fraud, or coercion to make them perform commercial sex or compelled label, labor. There are two types of trafficking, both sex and labor. The definition of sex trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for the purpose of commercial sex in which the commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such act has not attained 18 years of age. In the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, the term commercial sex act means any act on account of which anything of value is given to or received by any person. The, defini the definition for labor trafficking is the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for, for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. This webinar will not go into detail on what human trafficking is generally, but rather will focus on the role a faith-based organization may play in the human trafficking field. While anyone can be affected by trafficking, there are some populations at a higher risk that you may encounter in your work. These include, but are not limited to, refugees and asylees, immigrants and migrant workers, runaway and homeless youth, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, and intersex individuals, individuals with physical, emotional, and cognitive disabilities, and other survivors of crime. While it's important to keep in mind vulnerable populations and trends in human trafficking, remember that traffickers are equal opportunity exploiters. Human trafficking victims can be any race, gender identity, sex, age, or profession. There are certain populations that are particularly at risk, um, but don't let stereotypes cloud your judgment when looking for potential victims. So we have our first polling, polling question. So using the checkbox, select which of the following statements applies to you. I am from a faith-based organization. I am not from a faith-based organization, but I work in the faith with faith-based entities. I am not from a faith-based organization, but I am interested in learning about how to establish partnerships, or none of the statements apply to me. So I'll give a little bit to have those answers come trickling in. Okay, so it looks like we do have a pretty big spread, which is great. Um, it's, I'm, I'm really happy that we have a, a diverse audience, but a majority of the individuals that are on the call are from faith-based faith -based organizations. So I'm thrilled to have you all here and hope that this webinar, um, you'll all be able to take something out of this webinar. Okay, Karen. Thank you, Jenna. So as I mentioned, the Center for Combating Human Trafficking is not a faith-based organization. Um, we actually are a not-for-profit center that really falls under the umbrella of Wichita State University. And that was done intentionally because of the services we can offer through, within a university setting. Um, we are a survivor, or rather overcomer, I like to use that term, founded, led, and, and operated organization. And we seek to empower healthy relationships and promote holistic prosperity through the provision of direct services, 
education, training, technical assistance, research, and public policy development. Very specifically, just to give you a little bit of information in regards to our direct services, we offer a Prevention for Prosperity uh, program that is really primary and secondary prevention programming in elementary school settings as well as middle and high school settings, and then also with those same age populations in group homes, in shelters, et cetera. We also offer a Pathway to Prosperity program in which we um, offer a psychoeducational group for survivors of sex and labor trafficking and also provide them with mentors and pay for their education up through a master's degree as they have internships, um, which is full-time work for them, uh, within different settings that they have interest into in, in going into. All the methods that we facilitate, with all the methods that we facilitate, we utilize the, what we call the Lotus Anti-Trafficking Model. And one of our core beliefs with the model that we employ is this belief that those who have faced significant trauma, including commercial sexual exploitation, sex and labor trafficking, we don't believe that they are broken, but rather we believe that they um, were, were created uh, with a measurable value and purpose and they're resilient. And we have hope in their, in their redemption. We have hope in the ability for them um, to live a full and prosperous life. And so as we work with them, we work with them in developing all eight dimensions of their life, including physical, intellectual, emotional, creative, family and intimate partners, social, vocational, and financial dimensions. Because far too often within services of uh, care or in response systems that, that get involved with those who are sex and labor trafficked, they oftentimes just meet those, those temporary, very short-term acute needs. And so we want to ensure that when we are able to work with or rather walk alongside somebody in their journey of healing, that we help them develop as a whole person. Marissa? So Catholic Charities of Louisville is um, a faith-based organization and a community-based uh, social service provider for victims of human trafficking. We're the charity arm of the Archdiocese of Louisville. The mission of Catholic Charities of Louisville is to provide services for people in need, advocate for justice and social structures, and call the entire church and other people of goodwill to do the same. So all of the programming at Catholic Charities of Louisville is centered around that mission. We have a variety of programs, of which um, the Paquita Empowerment Initiative is only one. Um, and I would just add that there are many Catholic Charities organizations around the country. Um, each of them is unique and individual, and so each one might provide different programming. Um, so not all Catholic Charities provide human trafficking-specific programming, but I do know of a few around the country. So you would just need to check and see if your local Catholic charity is engaged in human trafficking specific service work. So in our direct service provision to victims and survivors of trafficking, we do address both sex and labor trafficking. We also provide a, a broad range of comprehensive services to male, female, and transgender individuals, adults and children, foreign national and domestic victims. Um, while we don't operate our own shelter, we do assist with emergency and transitional housing, as well as assistance with legal services, legal advocacy, therapy services, and other needs. We are also able to coordinate with our other internal programs to ensure more comprehensive services for clients, as well as making external referrals to other service programs. And the idea in our program is that um, our, our program participants will feel empowered that over time they'll need less and less services from us as they begin to establish themselves in the community and, um, and rebuild their lives and become economically independent also. So in regards to our approach to services, we, um, when we do intakes with clients, we really only ask that program participants establish some goals with us and that they work with us on meeting those goals as participants in our program, particularly for case management purposes. We also ask that they let us know if there are additional needs that arise where our support could be helpful. 
We don't actually engage in any faith-based activities with clients or require their participation in faith-based activities throughout their service period unless they asked or specifically requested that those services be provided for them. We want to ensure as best as we can that we are not mimicking, however inadvertently, the behavior of traffickers who likely offered to do things for them, to protect them, take care of their basic needs, but they ultimately require compliance with their demands first. And we want to ensure that we're not replicating that as service providers. We very much value providing services without any strings attached. We've heard from some of our program participants who have received services from other faith-based organizations that do require participation in faith-based activities, such as attending a Bible study or going to a certain church on Sundays, um, that they feel like they have to do those things to get services. And maybe they wouldn't really choose to do them otherwise, but they feel like they must engage in those activities to receive the services. So we're very cautious about that uh, and not engaging in those, those sorts of requirements ourselves. But compare that um, to the example of a program participant who's asked upon intake about any spiritual or religious preferences, which we do. We, we ask about the, that as in the same way that we ask about someone's educational level or other background pieces. Um, they have the opportunity then at the outset to say, yes, I would like to be part of X faith group. You know, could you help me get connected to them? Or they could say, no, you know, I have no, no preference and I'm not really interested in that right now. But based on their response, that may or may not become part of their service plan. So it's important that first, that they're asked about any spiritual preferences, and two, that their wishes are being honored. And that's part of comprehensive service provision, and it honors their choice. If this is a faith-based organization's approach to ask about spiritual um, needs in regards to services, the faith-based organization needs to be prepared to follow through. So for example, if we're requested by a program participant to be connected um, to a Hindu temple, we need to ensure that, they're, that, that the follow-through happens, that they're provided access to that service. Revealing information about a program participant's history or abuse to others, either as a means of engaging other faith community members such as requesting program participants to write their story in a newsletter to engage supporters, or discussing their story um, to pray for them or with a prayer group is likely to be perceived as manipulative by the survivor. And they may feel compelled to do so only to receive services, not because they would have disclosed that information otherwise. Um, so while intentions desires to pray for someone in a group or online posting or a phone chain, or to elicit additional assistance on their behalf, it is a breach of confidentiality without written informed consent to share information on behalf of that individual. Um, additionally, the focus on exploitation uh, some, that someone has experienced also encourages a narrative that may sensationalize the issue of trafficking and really focuses more on negative experiences as opposed to a narrative that's focused on empowerment moving forward and hope. So it's important to be cautious about how we intersect um, with the participants in our programming in that regard and be thoughtful and considerate of their consent and protecting their privacy. So um, because Mark is not here, um, I am going to go through his slides. However, I, I do want to say that I am not part of Buddy House, so I am not going to be able to go as in-depth as Mark would have been able to, but I felt that it was still very important to have his voice um, still Hi, heard here. throughout the webinar. Hello. Hi, I'm here. Hello? Hi, I'm here. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, is everything okay? Hello? Mark? Hello, hello, hello. Can you hear us? Yes, yeah, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so oh, I'm, I was about to go over um, Buddy House, um, but do you want to do a quick uh, preview of it? Sure, 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 sure. Hello. 
excuse me, the Buddy House is an organization. The Buddy means the better understanding of difficulties and differences within our youth, and our models will hug us just in our such a way. Um, we are a one-stop shop organization um, that where we are. The mission of, of us is to provide a life-building activities for our children with a focus on the male perspective. Uh, we raise awareness to the non-faith and faith-based community to help curb the causes that lead to domestic violence sex trafficking. Drug and alcohol abuse, sexual exploitation, homelessness, runaways, programs included. Um, we spotlight uh, dis dis disparities, I'm sorry, of the need to find uh, the issue. Uh, many communities still deny the existence of uh, the problem of uh, responsibilities to addressing the need of the Buddy House, especially within the faith-based organizations, um, when we talk about the male perspective. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and it, the need for us is to do one stop where we do everything in one house and then help our men become responsible to return back into the community. Um, we're looking, what happens, and the means of providing services for the crimes uh, with, uh, with the help and the support that we need to move forward in the lives of listening to the voices um, as we cheer with the faith based cheer and chat with the faith-based organizations to move the path forward to get them to understand the Buddy House Incorporated Initiative is a program that will service and that will meet the needs of the male domestic minor sex trafficking between the ages of 8 and 24. I'm not for sure how to, okay. The intake process for the Buddy House is, uh, it does not require participation in the faith-based specific activities or conversations to receive services from us. Individuals are not um, um, asked to be, are not about, asked about their faith um, affiliations to access, access services with us. Um, the relig religious affirmations and the spiritual self-determination um, is just a guided practice. It's something that we kind of show our light for, we kind of uh, show that we are Christians. Uh, we take time if the question comes up to us as far as uh, staff of the Buddy House, then we ask the question about them and we tell them about um, religion <coughs> or the faith-based area. Um, the outreach and the interactions, this includes quarterly conferences with pastors and churches and congregations meeting to talk um, about the broader picture of what's going on with trafficking. Uh, we try to do conferences and I'm sorry, there's no question. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Ready for our. Okay. 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 Thank you. With that, um, within the um, organization, our outreach and interaction are basically just that we meet with churches, uh, other uh, faith based organizations, and try to get the word out. Um, and in and, and return, um, telling them and showing them the broader picture of human trafficking when they have to focus on the male perspective. Um, we try to be trained with them, we try to do workshops with them, and we also do like a talking, teaching session to where we invite the pastors and the uh, elders and the bishops of various uh, organizations to one place and try to talk to them and give them more information about um, <coughs> the type of services that we're looking for and the type of support that we're looking for from the religious community. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> okay. Um, within our conferences that we meet, <coughs> one of the big focuses we talk about here with the Buddy House is the various conferences that the churches have in our community and other communities that we focus on. Um, what happens in different conferences, how human trafficking um, affects the faith base and try to get them to understand that large conferences, large conventions, houses are, or, are hubs or houses of sexual trafficking that occur under our noses or their noses and not really understand why or no one's no, not aware because we're such a big organization of what's going on. We're focused on the faith of it versus the community of it. Okay. So at Catholic Charities of Louisville, we have really focused on encouraging collaboration between faith-based organizations and the larger community. And a, a significant way that we've been able to do that is through task force and coalition development. 
For individuals who are part of a faith-based community or come from a faith-based perspective, we usually start with offering a human trafficking 101 or basic training or presentation. We encourage folks to invite other individuals from the organization to participate. And as part of that initial training on trafficking, we recommend very specific ways they can continue to engage, including connecting with any existing local task forces or coalitions. If there isn't an existing task force or coalition in that area, we would encourage those individuals to uh, discuss whether or not that's a possibility to start a new task force or coalition um, after initially investigating to make sure there aren't any already. Um, and we can help with that process. So our staff does try to attend to the different task force and coalition meetings in our area. And we could assist with starting an initial meeting, um, providing some logistical support and specific training to task force members, including a train the trainers. Our staff also tries to attend uh, task force and coalition meetings whenever possible to provide ongoing um, support to task forces. Um, for faith-based organizations who are interested in connecting with existing task forces and coalitions, we will um, put them in touch with the chairs or co-chairs of those task forces, provide them information about the meeting dates, and help coordinate an invitation to them to the next meeting. We very much encourage um, and participate in attending non-human trafficking and non-faith-based organization community groups as well, such as connecting with homeless coalitions or youth coalitions, folks serving immigrant and refugee populations. Um, we also partner um, a lot with non-faith-based organizations. Um, for example, we have an ongoing partnership with our local attorney general's office. Um, and we also collaborate on event-specific um, um, event specific initiatives with non-faith-based organizations, so doing outreach efforts together, creating training videos. Um, we've worked closely with local task forces and coalitions since the beginning of our program 10 years ago. Um, at that time, there were only two established task forces in the, Kentucky, in the, in the state of Kentucky. And since then, there have now been um, 10 task forces have developed in the state. Many of them are specific to a certain county or urban area, um, but each task force is a comprehensive group of service providers, government organizations, law enforcement, healthcare providers, and concerned community members. Um, so while the task force in a certain area might have been started by one or two specific groups, all of them have grown in some way to be multidisciplinary and engage various folks from the community. Um, and I, I just want to add here that, that the first funded task force in Kentucky was actually developed by the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth in a pretty rural area of the state. And they sought funding for their task force through a CHI, a Catholic Health Initiatives grant, which they wrote. Um, they worked really hard to um, pull together community members to start a task force in that area. And they utilized our staff um, to just support them and provide information specific to trafficking. And so we assisted them in the process of applying for the grant um, and assisting them in their steering committee as they started their task force. Um, so, and, and that was the first funded task force that allowed them to do training and outreach and purchase materials for the community. So we really do encourage a multidisciplinary approach and have seen in Kentucky how it can be very powerful and, and effective. In addition to task forces and coalitions, um, we do partner on funding and grant opportunities, working on specific projects together. I mentioned our partnership with the Attorney General's Office, and that particular partnership is specifically for Catholic charities to provide victim services while the Attorney General's Office works on um, increasing investigations and prosecutions on labor and sex trafficking throughout the state. We also work with local businesses, um, such as UPS, which is based in Louisville, and the Rotary Club of Louisville, to engage community members and businesses as volunteers to support programming and also for funding. A lot of that is for direct victim services. Um, We've also worked with faith-based organizations and groups within faith-based organizations on large community events, conferences, or even policy-related initiatives. So 
in Kentucky, it was incredibly challenging to get approval legislatively to post information in our rest areas. We tried for several years, and there was a lot of red tape, and it ultimately had to be handled through legislation and policy change at the state level. So some of our faith-based um, partners, particularly in some of the local coalitions, were integral parts of letting folks know about this legislation when it was a, a bill that had been proposed, providing support, calling folks um, to, to support this bill, and eventually it did get passed. And once it passed, then there was the work of putting posters together and framing them and putting them, putting them into rest areas, which was a lot of work um, throughout the state. And so one particular task force in Franklin County really took it on, to, took on the work of, of sitting down and putting posters into frames and getting them ready to then be dispersed out into um, the state, to then be put into rest areas. And that was largely a collaborative work with this coalition and um, faith-based group. And most of our activities that we engage in are outside of the faith-based realm because many of them are collaborative with other non-faith-based organizations, but we certainly do have a mixture of both. Marissa, I'm going to pause here because there were a couple of questions from the audience, so um, they should be quick. Um, the first one is, are there any cost estimates for the collaborations that you're talking about? And then the second one is, are your resources multilingual? So th there's not very much cost in the work of actually starting um, a task force or coalition as long as there are individuals who can dedicate some time to sitting down together um, and, and dedicating their attention to addressing some of these issues. Um, cost usually comes into play when you want to start developing materials, um, although there are some free materials available at the national level. If you want local specific materials, sometimes that would involve cost. If you want to host a training or event that's large, um, sometimes there are, of course, is cost related to that. Um, but even in those cases, the more collaborative you can be, the more you can share the cost. And if you come together, oftentimes one, one group can sh donate the space, another group can donate the speakers, another group might have some funding to, to copy materials or know how to access free ones. Um, however, the, bon the benefit to having some sort of funding stream for your coalition is that the reality is that if you're starting to address trafficking through a coalition or task force, you're going to start identifying cases and have victim service needs. And there does need to be, um, there needs to be access to resources for folks who are going to be identified as a result of all of that good hard work. And so while you don't want to necessarily wait for the one um, to do the other, they need to be things that are happening in tandem. So while you're doing this coalition development, there also needs to be some work being done about how to have access to services and have a system for response. Because what you don't want is to have victims being identified and there not being any stream of access to services for them. So I would encourage you to um, look in your community first and see if there are already any organizations doing trafficking-specific service work, because that is the most expensive part, is the services. Um, provide the comprehensive array of services that victims deserve and need. So, um, but just for the work of coalition building, there doesn't have to be a lot of cost. It's the work that comes with it, which is largely related to services. And then what was the second question, Jenna? Sorry, I was on mute. Do you use multilingual resources? We do. In Kentucky, we um, have a lot of materials in Spanish, um, but I would say uh, it's helpful to have resources available in whatever languages are identified in your area. Um, one of the most important resources to have is have access to interpreters, um, even if it's through a language line. I would also say that there are multilingual resources available at the national level through OTIP. There are look beneath the service materials are in various languages. Um, so, especially for outreach purposes, it's helpful to make sure that the outreach information is um, done in languages that are needed in your area. 
And we do have those um, specifically for outreach initiatives and for client intake and services. Great, thank you. Okay, Mark, are you there? Mark, can you hear me? Oh, hello, hello, yes, can you hear me? Okay, yes, go ahead. Okay. Safe space organizations should be working with the human trafficking field as a whole. Um, by the examples that I would, the examples I would do is um, by reaching out to nonprofit organizations such as the United Way, Sacred Heart, uh, trying to talk to them and focus on, on what we're doing to, about, to help them identify a uh, large network of connections. What I mean by that is that getting the word out again about the Buddy House uh, and other organizations that we're not basically, um, we're just a nonprofit organization that is trying to get involved with other organizations such as United Way, Sacred Heart, and other organizations. Um, we're trying to get our name out and build a relationship with the community because human trafficking is an area that we need and build upon. Uh, within the human trafficking area, um, what, what has not worked for us was uh, getting the understanding that the Buddy House is not after the funding sources, um, but we want to build an educational resource to address human trafficking. And in order for us to do that, we need to work with organizations and not against them or get them to understand that we're not here to hinder what they're trying to do. Um, we, our goal is to, one of the goals that we're trying to do is to benefit more readily, uh, ready, to benefit more uh, to have them again listen and learn from what's going on in the community. Uh, here in Georgia, we're noticed as number one as one of the highest uh, sex trafficking hubs due to our airport and other conventions and conferences that happen here, and we're trying to get the word out to them. Um, as many of you know that 2019, we'll be hosting the Super Bowl here, and again, uh, within the organization, we're trying to get the word out to these organizations. We are not after funding sources, but we're trying to do more educating and more prevention than what we're trying to, to uh, hinder with other organizations. Another example is that we deal with hospitals. Um, what does not work with the hospitals is that when a victim comes into the hospital, they're already uh, accused of being the perpetrator versus the victim. And we're trying to get them to understand that it's not always about, <clears throat> we're not always the uh, perp, in other words, if I can use that word lightly, but we're trying to educate them and get strength of communication follow and follow through with them because um, if they do a, uh, it just happened a couple of days ago, they do a rape kit and they don't follow up with that rape kit to make sure that is what happened. And then that person still goes out and has been trafficked and, and dealt with in a fragile way, if I can use that word lightly. Um, a benefit is uh, with us is by just opening doors of opportunity, um, receiving invitations to meet and speak with others in the networking area. Um, here in Georgia, again, we have several organizations that are uh, working with the cause of human trafficking, e either faith-based or non-faith-based organizations. But the opportunity is that everyone, the issue is that everyone is for themselves, and we're trying to change that culture of conversation that with it not being with, to not be in the loop by yourself, but to work with one another. Um, is the, we say in, it's better to fight in the army better than by yourself. So if we can build an army here, knowing that the Buddy House, the face the organizations, are working for one cause and one goal, then we should be able to um, make sure that, that the education component goes out for those. Um, local law enforcement organizations, um, they have lately have been instituting human trafficking teams. They've been lately instituting human trafficking conferences um, by building on one another. But when it comes to organizations such as the Buddy House and or the faith-based organizations, um, the issue is that they don't want the word out that they're not doing. Although what I mean by that, the law, law enforcement agencies are doing but not doing. Um, when questions come to them, you either put on hold or you put behind the scene and we'll get back to you versus when we need immediate assistance with educating, getting things out to organizations. We needing them to get involved with us as well. Um, what has not worked? Finding the right people to talk to. Um, turnover of law enforcement. Um, what I mean, and what I'm in back for because a second, what I we mean by talking to the right people, you'll see that one person's been put on this particular team to fight the cost of human trafficking, but six months later that person's been moved somewhere else. 
or that person no longer is in the fight of human trafficking. So who is the right person? Um, communication is the key. Um, we need to know who those people are, and they need to continue to follow up with us as we follow up with them as well to keep us updated if changes happen in organizations that we need to know our key component, who that person is that we need to work with. Um, the turnover in law enforcement, um, what happens with turnover in law enforcement, either they're promoted to captains, lieutenants, or things like that, and they move on, and they replace the person in the area, but that person does not know what was done already, so you're starting over again from the bottom up and versus starting from the middle point where you left off with. Um, the benefits of networking opportunity for training is awesome. And what I mean by that is the benefits for networking opportunities for training is simple. Um, out speaking at organizations or opportunities to speak in various places and others are involved there, others have been invited to hear what's going on and then invite you out to speak to another organization as well to try to get additional information out. That's a great benefit because someone else is hearing what's going on, but again, it backs up. We all need to work together as one big unit in order to make that happen. Um, Mark, there was one question from the audience um, for you to answer, and they wanted, somebody wanted to know if um, you provide residential services. We do not provide residential services at this time. That is one of our goals. Um, I call it a Step 3 program. Um, we have tiers that we work on, and that will be our long-term goal to provide roommate style housing to the there and then re-enter the community. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so um, so we have we're up to our next polling question, and this one we would love everybody to please use the, use the chat box to answer. So we'll give everyone a few minutes. But the question is, what are some of the successful strategies or models you have used in developing partnerships or collaborations with faith-based organizations? Okay, so we have some answers coming in. Um, some people are saying outreach, um, coaching and mentoring, a lunch and learn. Um, there was, a, I think, a, a prayer and learn, prayer meetings, sharing donations where needed, one-on-one um, -on -one conversations, um, people wearing T-shirts to drive conversations, creating a coalition with faith-based organizations and having a task force speak or a nonprofit speak. Um, participating in different coalitions or task forces, um, providing pastoral training, conducting stakeholder analysis and convening joint meetings, then create shared understanding by level setting with the same training on trafficking. Um, so these are all really great ways. I see a lot more outreach, education, um, yeah, monthly coalition meetings, so we're getting a lot of the same things, um, finding the same goals. So these are all great. Um, so let's move on to the next slide so that we can talk about some of um, the ways that our speakers have partnered. Thank you, Jenna. Again, this is Karen with the Center for Combating Human Trafficking. I think sometimes it can get a little bit um, confusing when you're participating in a webinar and you hear various voices. So of course we at the center have many non-faith-based partners that we've worked with for decades, including folks at the Department of Children and Families, the Attorney General's Office, and of course with sometimes great benefit and sometimes a little bit of difficulty, we also work with the law enforcement entities and the district attorney's offices, which of course with issues of, um, you know, perhaps immigration status or their individuals are weaving between being a victim, but also maybe they participate in recruitment, there can be difficulty with working with those entities. Um, but some of our best partners are our faith-based partners. This being said, over the years, uh, with the uprising of the anti-trafficking movement, 
so many interested partners joining the conversation, we oftentimes see so many entities, including faith-based partners, who get really excited about joining anti-trafficking efforts. They do a lot of fundraising, and then they fade away, which thus they unintentionally do harm to the broader movement, but also to the individuals who oftentimes are, are seeking resources and there's not enough available in a community. And so in order to assist in addressing this, we've really intentionally worked with various faith-based faith -based partners, and we've trained them very thoughtfully on our LOTUS model so that we can have a collaborative uh, partnership with folks and we're all speaking the same language. We're moving in the same direction. Some of our faith-based partners include faith congregations, churches, synagogues, also chaplain associations, and specifically detention ministry organizations. These groups are absolutely critical to us as within Kansas we have um, a continued rise despite the development of our laws, we have a continued rise of minors who, while they are victims and survivors of trafficking, are oftentimes detained in juvenile facilities on prostitution charges, or even they, are, they themselves face trafficking charges um, because they perhaps participated in the recruitment or maintenance of another minor survivor who was within the same staff, uh, trafficking stable. And then we work with faith-based not-for-profits. Some of the different things that we do with these faith-based partners is, of course, raise funds together, assist with awareness efforts. Um, oftentimes, our faith-based partners can offer counseling services. And they can also greatly help us shift paradigms in our community and shape a culture that can offer a larger community to survivors who wish to explore their faith. And that's absolutely critical to really work with a community not just on what is human trafficking, but who are the individuals who have faced this type of trauma? And how do we uh, really create a, a culture, a community, a context in which they can overcome their trauma? We also work with our faith-based partners to offer outreach and relationships with survivors in medical settings, jails, um, et cetera. We have a great need specifically uh, with survivors of sex and labor trafficking that are in jails, and, and we've had numerous cases where they have gone into these detention centers pregnant and have had miscarriages, for example, and our faith-based partners can offer such a great resource and provide support in these um, juvenile de detention centers as well as jails. We also work with them to offer books and, and provide letters and, and mentorship while survivors are detained and also while they exit detainment situations. And I want to say about the books, uh, for those of you who have not worked with juveniles um, or adults who have been sex or labor trafficked, they're in, when they're in detained settings, they oftentimes cannot just receive books or other materials from the outside. There, if, if you want to send a book, it has to be shipped, for example, directly from uh, Amazon or a particular a bookstore, and so that can get extremely costly for us, and so we work with faith-based partners to do that. And then we also have several of our faith-based partners who are trained in our Lotus anti-trafficking model that then offer psychoeducational groups, equine therapy, mentors um, themselves through their programs, and housing. So overall, you can really break down some of these partnership activities into short-term activities as well as ongoing. In terms of our short-term, this concludes things like awareness and education, event volunteerism, and then providing those basic needs and support systems to survivors. And then in terms of ongoing, we have a, an advisory committee that includes our faith-based partners. And we have, uh, every January, we have several uh, awareness events, and so we include them year-long to participate in these January events. We also have contracts with faith-based provi providers for program development and ongoing training. And then we offer direct service cross-referrals. So we have our own programming and direct service through our Pathway to Prosperity program, and so we're consistently getting referrals from our faith-based part partners as, as well as we are providing referrals to them, depending on the survivor and what their needs are. So for example, we have faith-based providers 
who offer housing. We offer housing only in dorm settings, but maybe that's not the best for a survivor, but we can offer them uh, psycho access to our psychoeducational group. Perhaps they are part of our survivor community network, um, or perhaps they are someone that we sponsor to go through our Pathway to Prosperity internship and pay for their schooling. So in considering doing presentations or engaging with faith-based groups, it can be helpful to consider all the different dimensions in which that can happen. So of course, identifying men's and women's and youth groups in a faith-based organization, um, but also groups that might focus on social justice issues from a faith context, interfaith groups, groups of faith leaders. Um, and what we have done at Catholic Charities is we have really um, focused on three specific messages. In, in our presentations to and in our work with faith groups. Um, one particular area of focus is ensuring that we always talk about labor trafficking as well as sex trafficking and the reality that they are happening in our communities and that both are important to address. Um, we also express that faith communities should care about human trafficking related issues, that it's a human rights issue. We have a moral imperative to care um, and we should seek opportunities to engage and to serve. Um, and we also, towards the end of any engagement, uh, whether it's a meeting, a presentation, initial coalition work, we always try to provide very tangible, specific ways for the faith community to engage. Um, and they can be very, they can range from very simple um, to very complicated and more time intensive and resource heavy so that folks can engage in a way that best um, suits the work that they're doing and um, fits best with what they're um, able to do or have the capacity to engage in. So um, one thing we, we try to um, make clear early on is um, the idea that unless you're a service provider with clinical experience um, and you're working in tandem with law enforcement, um, there's really not work to go out and rescue, quote unquote, folks. And we try to stay away from that language. Um, we really try to um, focus on providing services um, and engaging in very specific ways, provide for basic needs of identified victims. Um, we also might say um, to folks in the faith community, hey, pull out your phones right now and um, I'm going to give you the National Human Trafficking Hotline number and I'd like you to just program it in your phone. And then we talk some about what the National Hotline can do and what kind of resources they provide and when folks could call and for what purpose so that they have immediate access to the hotline number if they, if they need it. We also encourage folks to like certain Facebook pages, um, to follow them, to stay informed and up to date on human trafficking issues. And there are a variety of Facebook pages. Um, so we might mention a few that are local as well as some national resources. Um, and it's a good way to stay up to date and continue to get information about this issue. Um, we also encourage folks to investigate local organizations, see who's out there already and what they're doing and what they need. Um, that's one of the ways different faith-based organizations and individuals have been incredibly helpful to us is by identifying very specific needs and helping fill that gap. So I'm um, doing a, a toiletry drive for clients or uh, the toiletry bags that they frequently need from us um, or doing a gift card drive because we never seem to have enough access to funding and resources for food and um, other basic needs, personal items, um, even gas, gas cards sometimes. Um, another way that the faith community can very specifically engage even college students and younger students is to get quarters for us. We ask for folks to do quarter drives and get quarters because we need quarters a lot for folks who are staying in emergency housing to purchase food from a vending machine or to do their laundry or for folks who are in transitional housing with us. They might need to do laundry at their apartment. Um, and so quarters are very helpful um, and needed. And it's a simple thing that folks can donate or ask for. Um, we also ask um, members of the faith community to be more conscious consumers to look at transparency and abuse in supply chains and to purchase fair trade, direct trade, or survivor-made goods, both personally in their personal lives 
and also um, for their faith-based organizations. So one specific example would be if I'm speaking to a group of women who often serve food at their women's meetings, I might say, you know, next time you could maybe um, make your chocolate chip cookies with fair trade chocolate chips and then label them as fair trade chocolate chips. And that might start some conversation about what does that mean that you're serving me fair trade chocolate chips? And then there's a conversation about transparency and ethics um, in supply chains and that, that connects to labor trafficking, certainly. And then we also certainly encourage faith-based um, organizations and individuals to organize awareness events, to invite their circle of influence, their friends and family, or members of their faith community to host an event, a screening of a film, to host a panel discussion, and then we'll help support that event and come and, and provide information on our program and, and what we know based on the work that we do. Great. Thank you, Marissa. So we have our next uh, poll. And this is a question that everybody is to answer in the chat box. Um, but we are going to go back to it at the end when we're going through questions to address it. This will allow us some time to think about it and be able to respond appropriately. So what are some of the barriers you have encountered when establishing partnerships with faith-based organizations? And so I will let you all um, write some of the barriers that you have experienced, and then we'll have our speakers talk about some of the barriers and the challenges that they have faced. Thank you. And absolutely, some of these challenges that we've faced with faith-based partners, we've also faced, faced uh, with non-faith-based partners. So I really want to be clear on that. But some of the major ones that are extremely powerful because of the faith-based component have been just that, that oftentimes uh, the new to the movement faith-based partners have a lack of understanding of street culture, of exploitation, of labor, sex and labor trafficking. Um, there's also this historical mission oftentimes within faith-based communities to quote unquote rescue or save. Oftentimes, folks within a faith-based community will present to the survivors and overcomers that we walk alongside that they have all the right answers. And so, um, understandably, this can then be viewed as very exploitative. Also, oftentimes, um, survivors of trafficking have experienced religious practices that really are reflective of forced fraud and coercion. And so, in the name of good works, those who do not understand or appreciate the full and true nature of trafficking abuse or the context that allow for the true empowerment of healing end up doing more harm than good. And even worse, those who call themselves the quote unquote rescuers or quote unquote abolitionists or quote unquote advocates become just another face of the perpetrator. As we wrote about in an article that we've published called Rise Unite Support doing no harm in the anti-trafficking movement, we made a very specific statement due to some work with survivors that says, for many survivors, exposures to faith and spiritual practices have come in the form of a judgmental and controlling higher power, one whose authority manipulated them into submission, much like their abusive boyfriend, pimp, or trafficker. So this is absolutely then a challenge that we need to face head on and very directly so that we don't inadvertently do more harm. So as a faith-based organization at Catholic Charities, we do sometimes feel like we're stuck in the middle um, because there doesn't always seem to be space for nuance. For example, we are a faith-based organization, but we provide non-discriminatory access to services. Um, however, other organizations from the outside looking in to us as a faith-based organization might make some assumptions about how we approach services. Um, likewise, as I'm working on collaborating with other faith-based organizations or non-faith-based organizations, um, I might make some assumptions about uh, what they would provide or whether or not they would collaborate. Um, and this can be a very challenging space to navigate when different organizations, faith-based or not, have different approaches to service provision and different, different ethical frameworks for which they do their services. Um, so I, I would encourage uh, folks to sit down and have these hard conversations to try not to make assumptions, but to sit down with folks and talk about it. Um, we don't have to agree on everything, but 
we can choose to focus on what we can collaborate on and do well together. And if we're talking about focusing on um, raising awareness about human trafficking, better identifying victims, and helping survivors access services, we can find some common ground. And so let's work within that common ground and let's hold space. Let's hold space for nuance. Um, it's, it's hard to do. There are lots of challenges. Um, sometimes feelings get hurt or it's easy to feel offended when another organization doesn't approach things the same way or understand why you approach things the way you do. Um, I recommend folks to look at OVCT tax model standards for service provision, read through some of those, um, but also just consider why is it that you go about providing services the way you do and also ask other organizations the same sorts of questions. Why is it that you provide services in this way or why is it that you don't? Um, so that you have common understanding about why and how services are provided so you can find common ways to collaborate. And the reality is you can't always collaborate on everything with a certain organization. And sometimes it's about basic differences in ethical um, issues um, or ways folks approach services. And so it's okay. It's okay to say we can't collaborate on certain things, but this is the thing that we can collaborate on. And so I encourage you to find that common ground and to have those tough conversations and find the nuance. Religion industries lack the understanding of what human trafficking is. Um, it goes back to the understanding and training of those organizations. Um, the biggest uh, issue or concern is the hesitation for faith-based organizations and or churches to get involved due to fear of attracting unwanted communities such as pimps, perps, drug dealers, etc., even the prostitutes. Um, what we need to do is build a partnership among the faith-based organizations. Um, in a way that they are not scared off from going to or getting the support from a faith-based faith -based organization. For example, the church does not approve about everything that we, the Buddy House, does and or represent because of the misconceptions of homosexuality or lesbianism. But they're not open to speaking about this topic. Why? Because of the lack of training. Uh, we need to get them to understand, this, understand or change their mind that it's not taking, that we're not taking no for an answer because we want everyone to understand and get the information that we need to provide. Um, we want to get different modes of communication with billboards, emails, phone calls, face-to-face -face conferences, chat and chews, or et cetera, things of that magnitude. But the biggest obstacle that we're finding in places to go is to find congregations open to discussing trafficking as a whole. The biggest concern that I've seen that for the buddy house, because we deal with males, the, the word is not about women and children, but when we deal with males or boys, um, it doesn't happen to them, or they're the one that perp it. And we need to change that mindset. That is a lack of understanding. Um, the fear of that is when the conversation happens, it could be their own child, or it has happened to them, or it's happened to someone that they knew. We need to get them to channel that energy that they have and then move forward with that information so we're building, again, working as a team together and not against one another in the faith-based community or the non-faith-based community. And then we need to build a partnership with other organizations outside of those areas to get the lack of knowledge of concern and build inside. So in addressing some of the very specific challenges in working um, with faith-based organizations or um, being a faith-based organization collaborating with non-faith-based organizations, um, ethical differences in service practice can be a primary issue. And so um, I wanted to offer some basic questions that could be asked um, of you, of your organization, or from you to other organizations to help make sure there's clarity on how and why folks engage the way they do in this work. So. For example, if you're talking with another organization who is providing services in some way, it's really important to know if they have clinical staff. And if they don't have clinical staff, um, how are they going to ensure folks get access to clinical services that they need? Um, do they offer non-discriminatory services and access in a non-discriminatory way to services? Um, that's an important question to know. Um, and that will help determine probably whether or not you would feel comfortable um, collaborating with them 
in certain ways. Um, does an organization require participation in faith-based activities to access services? Um, that can be a really important question to know the answer to, especially before you make a referral to them. So for us, we want to know those things before we potentially send a client to services um, for residential shelter. Because if, if we haven't been given the indication by a client that they want to engage in faith-based services with a faith-based curriculum or requirements to participate in certain activities, we wouldn't want to make the referral to that agency. So we have to know that first. That's an important question to ask. Um, another important question to ask and to consider is whether there's a requirement for participants to speak publicly or to write their story um, for fundraising or to garner public interest in this issue. Um, that is a really challenging ethical dynamic for a lot of faith-based organizations, particularly those who um, don't utilize federal funding and rely heavily on private fundraising. But it's important to know that because you want to know what kinds of things um, folks are going to be expected to participate in if you were to refer a client to them. Um, some other um, challenges or things to consider um, is how folks engage in, in response to potential cases or reports of trafficking. Um, it was mentioned earlier that I, the issue or the idea of being involved in rescues. Um, we work closely to foster um, relationships with law enforcement in Kentucky because Catholic Charities is not involved in that process. Um, we're involved in service response. And so if someone contacts us with potential trafficking that's happening, our response would be to contact law enforcement who could go out and engage. And then once there are identified victims or survivors, then, they, then we would engage at that point. Um, and we, we very much feel like that is important for the safety of everyone involved and for really having the most efficient, effective response to ensure folks are getting access to services in a safe way. Um, it's also important for folks to understand what their, their specific role is and to work within that role. So if someone is engaging um, in anti-trafficking work purely for training and outreach, that's very, very different than engaging in direct services. And so those roles need to be clear, and folks need to have the background and expertise and education to support that specific part of the work that they're doing. And so that is another important conversation to have. Um, another challenge is sometimes there's a sense of competition, um, a sense of competition for attention among agencies, um, and a sense of competition in regards to funding. Um, and those are very difficult spaces to navigate. And there's not, I don't think, an easy answer to, to, to mitigate that conflict or potential conflict. I would just encourage you to know that if that's the reality for you, you're not alone. <laughs> it happens a lot, unfortunately, that there are just conflicts. And I would encourage you to have the hard conversations, share space with folks, invite folks to meetings, and again, try to find those things that you can come together on and focus on those. Thanks, Martha. Mark? I'm here, I'm here with this office. Okay. okay, go ahead. Challenges that happen in uh, working with faith-based organizations, uh, ensuring boys and men are not overlooked. Um, biggest challenge of that is because, of, again, it was just mentioned about funding sources. When funding sources take place or happen, that's the issue. Boys and men are overlooked um, within that. Um, there's a faith-based organization here in Georgia that provides funding for human trafficking but they only focus on women and children, so we need to make sure that we're not overlooking the boys and men as well. Um, change the mindset that boys and men are not victims. Um, the question is, how do we do that? Um, that that's our big How do we change that mindset? Um, the education component, the training component, um, we need more voices of male survivors to speak up and speak out, encourage them to, to say that's what's going on and, you know, help us get the word out. And also other organizations that work with uh, boys and men to encourage them 
to support one another, to stick together, to build that relationship, and get the word out to the faith-based organizations that, hey, we're victims as well. Um, funding sources um, to serve boys and men. It was just mentioned, um, funding is, is, is very scarce. Um, what do we do? How do we do it? How can we team up with one another to build some type of RFP for boys and men? How can we build um, um, uh, the foundations that are out there that support various organizations? How can we incorporate boys and men that, of human trafficking within that organization for funding? Um, being open to receiving training within the community. Um, being open to if someone calls you, hey, can we provide a training, or do you offer training services, or do you know of someone that provides that type of training for human trafficking, being open to receive those, being open to hear what's going on in your particular community. Here in Georgia, we have a, the uh, task force here, and the task force is built up of, of, of organizations, but they don't talk about the fact of the male and uh, the boy, the male, the men or the boys, or just the male in general. They don't talk about it because it's something that they don't want to hear. But when you hear about it and you build the opportunity to receive additional training about it, that opens up the door of understanding, that opens up the door of concern, and that opens up the door of uh, support. Uh, when you want training to get additional information because you can take the training that you receive from um, TTAC or from the Buddy House or from Catholic Charities in your particular area, and then you can move forward with that and build the information that you need. And establishing partnerships and sharing networks. A lot of faith-based organizations are scared to share information because they're thinking the organization, i.e. the Buddy House, is out for them or to take from what they had or what they have. And that's not the case. We don't want the information that you can share your partnerships and share your networks because we can build upon it because maybe it can help you grow as well as other organizations grow. Partnerships, building. Again, it goes back to the funding sources. It goes back to the training. It goes back to the community, the community involvement events that you can do because if you're sharing networks, everybody can come together as a whole and move forward and build the information and build the community within faith-based organizations. Thank you, Mark. Um, so quickly, let's go through this poll. Um, if everybody can um, please uh, provide an answer. Um, so please select yes or no. My organization has gone through trauma informs training. Um, has gone through trauma-informed training and incorporated best practices throughout policies and procedures, or has not gone through trauma-informed training at all? OK, great. So it looks like a lot of you have gone through trauma-informed training and started to incorporate some of those practices and procedures. So let's um, move forward and learn what some of our speakers um, do in their organizations to make sure that their um, organizations are trauma-informed. I noticed that a few participants made comments about, are we ever going to get to the advantages, the, the great things about working with faith-based organizations? And so I'm glad to, to start us off on that part of the conversation. You know, far too often, legal, criminal, and social service system responses really require that someone remain in crisis. And so when I think about the advantages of establishing partnerships with faith-based faith, faith -based community and specifically organizations, I feel like faith-based organizations are greatly set up to move beyond the rescuing to empowerment, healing, and growth, and really offer the context in which that can, can occur. Faith-based partners can really walk alongside survivors as they become holistically prosperous and assist in creating additional resources and extending a broader community to individuals who have been trafficked. Because hopefully, they don't have to only, they don't have to stick with these rules that say, I can only engage with you when you have these A, B, and C problems. Shaping trafficking um, knowledge in the faith-based community. Um, what do we do? We're in the forefront. Um, due to being consistent with, and partnerships, the Buddy House has become a known name in our community. Um, I'm known as the Buddy House. Everyone, when I go out to different organizations, before they say, hey, how are you? They know me as the Buddy House because we're out front. We're handing out pamphlets. We're handing out business cards. Um, we're getting in the community, handing out roses on a Friday night under bridges to homeless people. We're at truck stops doing different things like that. We have increased our conversations among, um, with the focus of boys and men. 
Uh, we've increased uh, with meeting with various council members in our city. In, various, in Georgia, we have several counties. Um, I've never seen a city like it, but we have several counties. And the Buddy House goes out to these different counties and get information out about what's going on. Uh, invitations are extended to, to host trainings and events throughout our faith-based community and also our non-faith-based community lately that we're doing these types of trainings, get information out. The opportunities are arising to advocate on collaboratively to change local, state, and federal uh, legislation. And we've been, uh, we were able to assist with several bills that passed here in Georgia. We have a new mayor here that she's instituted a human trafficking team on her own council to work with us, the Buddy House, and other organizations here in Georgia to help fight against uh, human trafficking. Um, shaping trafficking knowledge in the faith-based community is just that, getting the information out to the people, getting trainings out, um, holding, again, I mentioned chat and choose, holding um, lunch meetings, holding um, various uh, conversations and public things, getting into the school system, talking with the school superintendents, and how we can advocate getting additional information out into the schools as well to talk about human trafficking as well as the, the domestic violence piece that happens that we all talk about here in our schools. But that's what we do, shaping traffic knowledge, getting the information out, building knowledge for us. For the past three or four years, Catholic Charities has worked closely with the Justice Resource Institute of Boston to provide their um, curriculum on its prevention education and support group curriculum called My Life, My Choice, specifically for adolescent girls. And it's a it's designed to be 10 weeks for each class and covers a variety of topics um, meant um, to address issues of safety and risk and sexual exploitation. Um, and we have really worked a lot with volunteers to provide those groups. And so what we do is we work with Justice Resource Institute to provide the curriculum and the training to facilitators, which is a two-day commitment to get this training. Um, folks can either go to Boston and get the training in Boston, or we can host um, the My Life, My Choice training in Kentucky and invite folks to participate. Um, and once an individual is trained on the curriculum, they can then begin facilitating these groups. And they serve two purposes, really, prevention education for girls who are high risk or at risk, but also um, trauma support for girls who have already been exploited. Um, so we, we collaborate with Justice Resource Institute, but also with local partners and volunteers, including members of the faith community, to provide these groups um, both in residential shelters for youth um, as well as in community-based settings. We've even done the groups in juvenile detention facilities and in public schools. Um, as part of these groups, we also um, um, provide survivor guides that were created by GEMS, Girls Education and Mentoring Services in New York. Um, the survivor guide was written by survivors of child sex trafficking, and we provide those books to all of the participants in the My Life, My Choice classes. Um, we are working now on developing a pilot program for boys that would be prevention-based and also a trauma support group for boys. Um, so that's in process because we keep hearing that that is a need that hasn't been met in Kentucky communities. But um, our, our relationship with My Life, My Choice and the work doing these groups locally has been, it just keeps expanding. There continue to be more and more requests for um, these groups and for facilitators to provide the group. So that's been a great collaboration that we continue to work on. So local faith communities are an existing and natural resource that, if appropriately trained and equipped, can offer this support to survivors an environment in which survivors can explore and develop their spiritual selves that are central to holistic health and wellness, but also where survivors might develop meaningful, ongoing relationships that can create the context in which victory over trauma can progress. The faith community can offer opportunities for survivors to explore their spiritual beliefs, resolve questions that present throughout the, their lifetime, create a network of friends and, and pseudo-family members that hold similar values and beliefs, and even more so, obtain lifelong opportunities to cyclically recovery, develop, flourish, thrive, and lead. But 
in order to do this, in order to be successful in offering this, there's some best practices. And these aren't really um, magical tools, but things like self-awareness, offering extended support networks, and ensuring that you yourself can have an extended support network, and also an ongoing commitment to learning is necessary. So in terms of self-awareness, oftentimes what we see is that more important than the technical skills of research-based uh, practices is the ability to be self-aware and responsive to one's own trauma, triggers, struggles, et cetera. And, and when we're able to practice this, we can readjust our thinking and behavior patterns and really engage intentionally. Oftentimes I hear folks talk about those who have been trafficked as though they are broken or damaged. But ultimately we, are, we all have faced trauma and we're all wounded healers. The second in terms of um, offering, but more importantly, even obtaining your own extended support networks is, again, this is not just for survivors, but for volunteers and for providers who have committed to walking alongside survivors. And, and I say that this is critical because far too frequently we see, we see individuals who want to engage with survivors and they quickly learn that they cannot do it all. Um, and so we ensure that specifically within our Pathway to Prosperity program, we ask that mentors, uh, that they have their own network of folks that they can call and rely on, perhaps to just debrief a day or debrief their difficulty that they're having with the survivor that they're walking alongside, but also to make sure that they don't have to do it all. Perhaps they have an extended network that can help bring them or their family meals or help the survivor with various needs so that they don't have to do it all. And then a commitment to learning. You know, we'll never know it all. Um, each person that you meet is bound to make a rookie out of you, specifically in regards to trafficking. Um, and then also a commitment to transformational relationship. You know, I think with, with folks who have experienced trauma, they've had so many people come in and out of their life. And it's not helpful to come into somebody's life and build a connection just to quickly leave them. So that commitment is absolutely critical. One thing also to continue to learn about is trauma. And I've seen some comments mentioned about a trauma-informed approach, and obviously we asked the question about how many of you have been trained on this. And we believe that this is one of the things that you need to have a commitment to learning and a commitment to practicing within your organization. A trauma-informed approach begins with understanding the physical, social, and emotional impact of trauma on the individual as well as on the professionals who help them. This includes victim and survivor-centered practices by incorporating four specific elements. First, realizing the prevalence of trauma. So realizes the widespread impact of trauma and understands potential paths for, paths for recovery. The second thing is recognizing how trauma affects all individuals involved with the program, organization, or system, including its own workforce. And so a trauma-informed approach recognizes the signs and symptoms of trauma in patients or clients or families, staff, and others involved with the system. Three, the third element is responding by putting this knowledge into practice. So a trauma-informed approach responds by fully integrating knowledge about trauma into policies, procedures, and practices. And the fourth element really seeks to actively resist re-traumatization. So a trauma-informed approach also seeks to actively resist re-traumatization by inadvertently triggering a person. So key triggers to re-traumatization include feeling a lack of control, experiencing unexpected change, feeling threatened or attacked feeling vulnerable or frightened, and feeling shame. And so when we're engaging, again, as faith-based partners or non-faith-based organizations, we need to ensure that we're not doing these things, that we're engaging in a way that does not trigger an individual. Again, this is not just for faith-based organizations, but organizations across the board. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration has identified six guiding principles of trauma-informed care. And this, these six guiding principles are safety, trustworthiness and transparency, peer support and mutual self-help, collaboration and mutuality, empowerment, voice and choice, and cultural, historical, and gender issues. 
In terms of safety, throughout the organization, staff and the people they serve feel physically and psychologically safe. So it's important that we provide a welcoming environment, be sensitive to potential triggers that might remind a patient or client of past trauma. I, we can offer quiet spaces, um, even in a busy office or practice, that can be used to speak to the patient or client. Don't pressure a patient client to answer questions if they hesitate. Be kind. Potential victims of trafficking may be belligerent or even hostile. I've been flipped off a few times. But we have to remember that their life experiences and past traumatizations make it difficult to trust care, to trust care providers or people in authority. In terms of trustworthiness and transparency, organizational operations and decisions are conducted with transparency and the goal of building and maintaining trust among staff, patients, clients, and family members of those receiving services. So it's important that we maintain appropriate professional boundaries, clarify our roles, obtain informed consent, be consistent. It really takes time to build trust, and we have, so we have to offer this consistency over a period of time and really make sure that we follow through and do what we say we're going to do. In terms of peer support, seek out networking opportunities to share with patients and clients. Peer-to-peer -peer counseling and mentoring from survivors who are now serving in a victim services or life coach capacity. As I mentioned, uh, the center is a survivor-led, informed, uh, run organization, and one of the, the greatest gifts that we have is an opportunity to hire what we call prosperity coaches, young, newly, uh, new survivors and overcomers to coach their peers. And so what this would look like is engaging peers with empathy, respect, and support, providing meaningful opportunities to peers to facilitate, organize, and coordinate activities, and hire survivors with appropriate skills to mentor other survivors or provide peer-to-peer -peer programming. In terms of collaboration and mutuality, there's a true partnering and leveling of power differences between staff and clients and among organizational staff from direct care staff to administrators. There is recognition that healing happens in relationships and in the meaningful sharing of power and decision making. So we need to maximize opportunities for collaboration and sharing of power between staff and with survivors. Recognize that everyone has a role to play in trauma-informed care. One does not have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. In terms of empowerment, voice, and choice, it's important that throughout the organization and among the patients clients served, individual strengths and experiences are recognized and built on. So being trauma-informed would look like allowing patients and clients as well as staff to share their experiences and ask questions as needed. Be transparent in explaining options in your role. Respect the decisions patients clients make, even when you disagree. And then in terms of cultural, historical, and gender considerations, being a trauma-informed organization would mean that you actively move past cultural stereotypes and biases based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, geography, et cetera, offers gender-responsive services, leverages the healing value of traditional cultural connection, connections, and recognizes and addresses the historical trauma. This could mean that you provide translated materials and qualified interpreters for patients' clients as needed, respect cultural identity and practices, and recognize and address historical trauma. And it's within a trauma-informed environment, um, like we have at the Center for Combating Human Trafficking, and that the other speakers have mentioned within their organizations, Buddy House and Catholic Charities, that we can then respond to the holistic needs of an individual. This is our load, a small glimpse of our Lotus anti-trafficking model specifically focused on those eight dimensions. But we know we can't really begin the real work if we don't have a trauma-informed approach. So some of the major lesson learned, lessons learned that we've experienced partnering with faith-based organizations is that the needs of all individuals often extend beyond the resources of just one organization. Survivors really need more than a short-term professional interaction, and survivors need access to a committed, long-term community. Far too frequently, the professional nature of services are limited and cannot provide the lifelong setting for the healing process to continue and reach, reach its culmination. And so it's important to collaborate and intentionally organize and provide services in a manner that allows for biopsychosocial and spiritual wellness. This includes providing services that recognize and utilize, utilize individual strengths, resilience factors, and resources, 
and are not only survivor-centered, but survivor and overcomer-led, ensuring that beyond professional services, overcomers have the ability to be a part of a consistent, lifelong community. It means offering opportunities for survivors and overcomers to thrive and prosper. Karen, thank you so much. Um, and thank you all of our speakers for all of the information. That was excellent. I do want to be mindful of time, so we will start to wrap things up. Um, and I do want to ask everyone to um, please make sure you stay on until um, after this presentation. And we will be um, putting a link up on the screen for you all to um, provide some feedback and, and uh, do an evaluation for us. Um, there has been tons of chat in the chat box amongst audience members and to our trainers, um, and so this was incredibly fruitful. We really appreciate all of your time. Um, and please do go to our website to stay connected with us. It's the best way to stay up to speed on what's going on with NITAC and the federal agencies that we part with, uh, partner with. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you again.